So, so? Ah, thank you. So, Andra just came in here and asked me to start a few minutes late because there were a few sessions, other sessions that were running late. So, that's why I, I've waited a few minutes. Um, so, thank you for sticking with me. And thank you guys that are just entering the room. Welcome. <laughs> so, my name is Hanno. And uh, before I get started, I have a little disclaimer for you. I'm a Java software engineer, no surprises there. Um, but I'm also a musician, and I also like science fiction. So, in fact, I think my bio on the website of Fox Days Bucharest even says strong with the force. So, you won't be surprised that this talk may contain some musical elements and also some sci-fi references. So, I hope you guys are okay with that. In the end, please don't tell me afterwards that I didn't warn you, because you have been warned. Now, as you're reading the title of this talk, uh, I'm assuming you, you've done this, I bet you have lots of questions. Maybe you're wondering, what is OCR anyway? Or you're wondering, what is Tesseract? And what is up with this fourth dimension thingy? And why is it in the title? I, I think now is as good a time as any to talk about this fourth dimension thingy. So let's get this out of the way straight. Now, in geometry, a tesseract is a four-dimensional cube, and I've always found it very difficult to truly understand this fourth dimension. I mean, is it time? Is it hyperspace? Is it the matrix? As our daily lives are bound by only three dimensions, it's very hard to imagine what it would be like to experience a fourth dimension. And the animation that you can see right now on the screen is a very very imperfect approximation of what a fourth dimensional cube would look like because we can't imagine it, imagine it because our world doesn't have a fourth dimension. Now, despite many hours of research, and believe me, I've tried, I'm sorry to say that I haven't been able to find out why the OCR library that we're talking about today is called Tesseract. And believe me, I've really tried. I've went to page 11 of Google, insanity. Right? It, I can't find it anywhere, but it is called Tesseract anyway. And the bottom line is, because this is a four-dimensional cube Tesseract, I decided to structure my talk in, not in four sections, but in four dimensions. Because sections are boring and dimensions are awesome. So, and I think also, when I try to introduce a new section, or in this case a dimension, it's a lot more dramatic to call it dimension. And it allows the use of dramatic music and sci-fi movie clips, which I like both a lot. Sci-fi and music are great. So, what is OCR? Let's get started and enter the first dimension right away. Dum, dum, dum. Yeah. Side note, I like doing my own music. It's a little hobby of mine. But you have been warned before, so. The first dimension is called, what is OCR? Well, OCR is a technology that can take written words and convert them as, uh, what? What does this say? I can't read any of this. Ah, because that's because I've OCR'd it from an image with just a bit low quality. Sorry about that. I tried to zoom it, but doesn't make sense, you know, the resolution is just too low. And I try to OCR it, but well, if your image quality is crap in the first place, you will never get clear text that is understandable and readable. So let's try this again with an image that's, that's of better quality. And if you run this through the OCR tool that I'm discussing today, you'll get a technology that can take written words and convert them back into computer-readable form, provided they're in the right font, using the correct colors, sometimes, at the right point size and pitch dark enough on the paper, and you're prepared to spend several centuries correcting all the ones that come out as L's, all the O's that come out as zeros, and all the colons that come out like semicolons. Okay, all joking this aside, when I go to Wikipedia, this is what it tells me when I ask for a definition. The mechanical or electronic conversion of images of typed, handwritten, or printed text into machine-encoded text, whether from a scanned document, a photo, a scene photo, or, for, or from subtitle text superimposed on an image. 
Now, have you ever noticed that our eyes and our brain are quite excellent at OCR? As you are reading the words on the screen right now, they are carrying out optical character recognition without you even noticing. Your eyes are recognizing the patterns of light and dark that make up the characters printed on the screen, and your brain is using those to figure out what I'm trying to say, sometimes by reading individual characters, but mostly by scanning entire words and whole groups of words at once. So this is a classic problem in which humans excel and computers must be taught how to solve it, like chess, or playing chess or playing Go. Now, if everyone wrote the letter A exactly the same way, getting a computer to recognize it would be very easy. You would just compare your scanned image with a stored version of the letter A and then check if the two images matched. But of course, this is not the case. Everyone is writing the A a different way. And these are just all uppercase letters, also lowercase ones. Um, so when the OCR field started and, and, uh, and matured, uh, around uh, the 1960s, there was a, a special font was designed um, s that uh, that would be easy to read for computers and for OCR software. And it was called OCRA. You might recognize this font because it it mainly occurs on uh, on checks uh, and and forms that you use uh, with your bank, for example, financial transactions. Also, separate printers were designed that could print this font, and um, the OCR software at the time could read it quite, quite okay. And notice, for example, um, that um, specific uh, adjustments were made to, uh, for example, the, the digit 1. So they made a little loop at the right edge, because that was to distinguish it from the letter L. So that's why they, they designed it this way. Uh, but of course, the trouble is, most of what the world prints isn't written in OCRA. And nobody uses this font for handwriting, right? So the next step was to teach OCR programs to recognize letters written in a number of very common fonts, like Times, Helvetica, Courier, and so on. Um, and for that, pattern recognition won't be enough at all. Uh, so most OCR programs use a feature called feature detection, in which they somehow apply a rule like this. If you see two angled lines, that meet in a point at the top, like this letter A here. And there is a horizontal line between them about halfway down, and that's the letter A, feature detection. Um, so most modern OCR pro programs that can handle multiple fonts work by feature detection rather than pattern recognition. And some even use neural networks. So a few milestones in the history of OCR. In, in the 1900s and 1910, already some basic image scanning was, was achieved, uh, but in 1929, Mr. Gustav Toschek from Vienna patented his basic OCR reading machine. And they are based on the idea of losing, using a light detecting photo cells to recognize patterns on paper or a card. Now, in 1949, another machine was developed that could read text out loud to blind people at the rate of of somewhere between 60 and 65 words per minute. So it was quite cool already. Um, now, in the 1960s, as the OCRA font became available, postal service around the world began, began to use OCR technology for mail sorting. So they could just uh, recognize the addresses that you write on your envelopes and sort it so that it uh, will go uh, the right way. And most postal services use systems that relate to this one uh, today right now. Not a milestone, the Apple Newton was the first handheld computer that featured handwriting recognition. And this has become increasingly popular on cell phones, including the Palm and the Palm Pilot. And in the year 2000, researchers at the Carnegie Mellon University um, developed the spam busting system called CAPTCHA which is, in fact, some sort of OCR system, but then flipped the other way around. And nowadays, OCR is, in fact, it's everywhere. So I've, I've, I've listed a few applications of OCR for you. Uh, I've talked about this before. Financial transfers, you know, from the movie Catch Me If You Can, Mr. Frank Abagnale uh, wrote his checks uh, and printed his checks with the OCRA font. Watch the movie if you don't believe me. Uh, also, book digitization. So you digitize a book on one of the machines that, uh, that's displayed on the screen, and 
If you've done that, you can just press Ctrl F and search your book instead of flipping through the pages. Uh, passport scanning. I got here by scanning my passport, and it recognized the number on the on the passport uh, card, and it, it 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 saw that there was a passenger uh, checked in with that passport identification number, so I could pass through the through the through the gate, through to the gate. And um, yeah, number plate recognition. <laughs> if you're speeding a lot, you'll know about this one. Your government will make sure that your speeding tickets arrive even faster because of OCR. So OCR is everywhere nowadays, even in, uh, in XKCD comics. And you know if something has been in an XKCD comic, well, then it's everywhere. And then it's very important, too. OK, so let's get started. It's time to enter the second dimension. Dun, 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 dun. I guess it's this from the wrong sci-fi movie. But hey, nobody's perfect, right? Um, the second dimension is called getting started. Now, Tesseract, this de library has been developed since 1985, and it was first developed at Hewlett Packard. And it began as a PhD research project in Bristol, United Kingdom. And it gained momentum as a possible software or hardware add-on for Hewlett Packard's line of flatbed scanners. And they, uh, they, they developed it for some time, and they entered a contest in 1994, uh, which, they, which they won. So the, it was tested against multiple OCR uh, tools and frameworks, and they came out on top. Um, after that, not much, not much had happened. Um, um, and um, in 2005, uh, HP uh, released it, it as open source software. Um, so uh, when it was ported to Windows, it was rewritten in C++, and it was released in 2005 on the Ap Apache license. And um, after it was published as open source, a few people tested it, and Mr. Anthony Kay from the Linux Journal, he wrote, the core feature, text recognition, is drastically better than anything else I've tried from the open source community. So some of the, its features, well, of course, character recognition, it supported Unicode, and you could feed it JPEG input or GIF, PNG, TIFF, or bitmap, and output could be plain text, uh, tab sep separated files, Searchable PDF also, so PDF with a text layer on, on top, or HOCR. I've included a small example of HOCR because I didn't know what it was until I started using Tesseract. So here it is. It's a sort of HTML variant, and it expresses in quite a lot of detail uh, which words were recognized, so in this case from a German text, but also um, how certain the OCR software was of the fact that this word was recognized correctly. So this is expressed as a confidence integer. So 100 obviously is the best confidence that it can get. Zero is the lowest. So if the confidence is 96, no, then the OCR software is fairly certain that this is the right translation. And there are also bounding box coordinates. So a bounding box is the smallest rectangle that can fit around one character. So lots of information can be extracted. Now, the reason why my attention was drawn um, to Tesseract was because it's been used by Google a lot. So after it was open sourced in 2005, Google uh, maintained it, maintained the library and developed it further. And um, Google used it in multiple occasions. They use it in videos on YouTube for text detection. They use it on mobile devices. And they also use it in Gmail. Now, I've been a user of Gmail from the start. So in 2004, Gmail was, uh, was uh, launched. And by 2006, Gmail was one of the best uh, uh, spam detector free email services. So that's why a lot of people switched to Gmail. Um, so, and the problem arose because the spammers knew this, and they started using a new trick. They sent empty email bodies and embedded the spam text in an image attachment. Well, Gmail had the feature to uh, preview image attachments. So um, it, it was displayed by default. Any image attachment was displayed by default. So, so the spammers really got their message through, through the image attachment. 
and uh, could fool the, the spam filter of Google. So to deal, to deal with this, Google started to use Tesseract on these image attachments in Gmail. Um, and of course, after the, the text had been uh, recovered, they could easily classify them as spam because in that case, it was no more difficult than just a regular plain text email. So I thought bec when it's used by Google and it's maintained by Google, they're using their own, their own product. So uh, let's give it a try for my own project. Now in the past two, three, uh, three years, two new versions of Tesseract have been published, which also contained a few new features. So for example, uh, version 3 contained page layout analysis. Um, so it could analyze a certain page and tell you this page is div divided in three columns or there's a table or something. And before that, uh, Tesseract couldn't even do that. So if you would feed it a text that was divided in two columns, it just said, well, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> you try yourself. Uh, and this is because uh, it was ori ori originally developed by Hewlett Packard, and they had their own independently developed page layout analysis technologies that was used in their products. So they already had page layout analysis. They didn't need to rebuild it again in Tesseract. So it's never Tesseract until that moment never needed its own page layout analysis. Um, so in version three, uh, since the open source ma uh, ma the open source making, they added it. And in version 4, which just was released uh, November 2018, it contained uh, a neural network recognition engine. Uh, I call it LSTM here. It's, uh, it's, it stands for long short-term memory. So it's a kind of recurring neural network. And the Tesseract pe people claim that the accuracy has increased dramatically. We'll see about that later in the talk. Um, so what if you wanted to use this library in Java? Well. Uh, there is a Java JNA wrapper for Tesseract. It's called Test for J. Uh, JNA stands for Java Native Access, and it's a commu community developed library that provides Java programs with easy access to native shared libraries. So in this case, Tesseract is a C++ code base. You can just install it on your, on your uh, computer. And Test for J makes sure that it can call the C++ code from Java. So it's like an API that you can call from Java, and it will pass pass it on to uh, to Tesseract and the, and the C++ source files. What are the features of Test4j? Um, well, for example, so just besides being a, a, a very simple wrapper for Tesseract for Java, it also has a few extra features, and one of them is PDF input, so Tesseract uh, usually just uh, get as input uh, an image file, and uh, Test4j can also handle PDF. It will uh, convert it under the hood to image files. Um, you can also feed it multi-page TIFF inputs. So this is the way it works. Uh, Test4j will read the PDF, then convert it to multi-page TIFF inputs, and then will send, the, send this page by page to Tesseract. And it also contains some image optimization options that y you can use to uh, automate your image optimization. So for example, you can de-skew your image, so rotate it a bit so that it, it's more straight, or you can convert it to black and white or grayscale. If this improves your recognition uh, confidence, then you can use that. So these features all exist to improve your OCR results. I'll talk about competitors later on in the talk, but first, first I would like to give a quick demonstration of how it works and how you would use it in your, um, your project. So here we are. Is the, the font size large enough for you guys in the back? Yeah, readable? Great, thanks. So the only thing I've done until now is I did a Gradle init, which created just an empty project with some, uh, with some, uh, some dependencies that I don't, don't even need, but it's just a project setup. And I've copied a few images that we're going to test during the demonstration. But I, I've done nothing else. So you can just do a Gradle init, and you'll be at the same place as, as I am right now. Um, well, the first thing we need to do is we need to um, make sure that we have the test for j dependency. And right now, I don't have it anywhere. Um, so I'll, I don't even know the, uh, the group ID and the artifact ID by heart, but I've, I've prepared a few uh, Git tags in my uh, repository to help me out here so that you don't uh, have to watch me typing artifact IDs. 
So if I, uh, I get lost along the way, I can just check out one of these Git tags. But I'll try not to use them. So the first one I'll use is uh, uh, dependencies added. Because in this, in this commit, um, the dependencies have been added, and I haven't, don't have to do anything. So here it is. The only thing you need to add is this one. Test4j net.sourceforge. Version 4.3.1 is the latest version. And then we'll return to our Java class. I'll just focus on getting it, getting it done so that it works in the shortest amount of time. So don't, don't bug me about design patterns or don't repeat yourself things. Well, maybe I, don't, I don't think I will repeat myself, then, but apart from that. OK, let's, so let's create a main method. Um, well, the interface class that we're using for test direct is called iTestDirect. You just have to create it. Here we go. And you have to tell it where the Tesseract binaries are located, so where your Tesseract system is installed. So I'll just call set data path, and we need to um, retrieve the data path where my Tesseract installation is. Again, I don't know it by heart, but I can ask it. So uh, being on macOS, I, tr I uh, used Homebrew to, uh, to install it. You can do the same, or you can use another package manager. I just ask my package manager where my Tesseract installation is, and it tells me it's li right here. And uh, the data files that is asked by Test4j is this one. Oh, this doesn't work at all. I have to do it by mouse. So I'll just copy this path. See, I forgot a, I forgot a forward slash, but I'll add it in later, like this. There we go. So this is the data path. And also, you need to tell it what language you will be using. Well, the first image that I'll be testing has an English language, so I'll set the language to English. There we go. And then it's simply a matter of calling the duocr method. So it's called duocr, and it takes a file. And um, it returns a string. So it returns the plain text that has been recognized. So let's create a new file. And the first file that we'll be testing is uh, it's in source main resources. And the first file we'll be testing is one of my favorite books, Clean Code. Who's read, read Clean Code? Great book. If you haven't started reading it tonight, <laughs> or when you're on holiday, it's a good read. This is just one page from the book, but still. Uh, clean Code. Um, I have to do some imports, of course. Um, then this throws an exception, I guess. So I'm going to do something that you shouldn't try at home or at the workplace. Please catch your exceptions. Please do. <laughs> I haven't told you that you can throw them in a main method, but I, I've just done it because for demo, demo purposes. And then um, this returns a string, so let's uh, assign this to a string um, uh, text, and let's print it. There, well, I think this should work. Famous last words, right? Uh, but still, I'll give it a go. Let's see what it says. Take some time. Well, there it is. I haven't even showed you the picture. Sorry about that. I should have done that. So this is a picture. It's just one page from the clean coding, clean code book. It's quite a good quality. <laughs> you know, it's 1280 by 1647, so no problem there. And um, here is the output, and it looks well, it looks okay, right? I don't don't see any huge <laughs> huge errors or something. Um, well, I'll go into uh, Canva this a bit later. So, so, so Tesseract knows knows uh, how much of this is okay. Uh, Tesseract can approximate it. But right now, I'm just talking about the plain text. But I'll I'll, I'll get to confidence later. Now, what would happen if we would um, have a bit of text that is in a different language? I mean, would it still work? Um, first thing I want to do is uh, create a different method for this. Uh, so let's do it. <coughs> Void, we call it duo CR, so that I can call it multiple times, you know. File, image, file, file. And I'll just copy this, I'll cut it, and paste it here. There we go. Um, 
I need to move this also. I want to make sure that the language, the language uh, value I can p pass as a parameter. So let's pass it as a parameter. Language code, put language code here. Write this. And then, then we'll just call duos, mm, not a dual while. Oh, I haven't used a dual while in ages <laughs> since the streaming API. Uh, duo CR. Then I'll just copy this file, f the English version, of course. There it is. And I'll pass it a language code uh, ENG. And then I can just copy this and try a different language. Well, I, I, I acquired a, an image. Uh, that is uh, a bit of the uh, ancient Greek New Testament. Just for fun, let's see what happens when we pass English to it. Um, what's wrong here? Uh, I need to pass the, the image file, of course. Image file. And of course, this will be about exception throwing. Look away now. <laughs> Please don't do this at home. So let's try. I'll show you the new testament file. It's just a bunch of Greek letters. I tried to, uh, I tried to uh, research what part of the Bible it was, but I couldn't find it because my Greek's very bad. So, <laughs> but it's it's a Greek text. Uh, so that's all we need to know for now. Um, and let's let's try to do some OCR on this. Let's see what happens. So it should output both. Uh, ah, so here's the English one. Well, we uh, we recognize this. We did it before, and this is the Greek one. And it's it's mayhem, right? It's carnage. I mean, this can be right, and it's because we passed the wrong wrong language to it. So let's change it to Greek and run it again. I think it will be a, be a lot better. There we go. That's better, isn't it? Well, it seems better anyway. Uh, any Greek speakers? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. Well, then, then we can check, can we? <laughs> okay. Um, so I want, to, I want to add a little bit of output to make the user experience a little bit better because there's no way that you can know it, that it's doing something. So I'll just print out um, um, uh, um, processing image. Please wait. It will be a bit nicer. If, if I do it like this, yeah, it's all about user perception, right? Okay, there we go. Uh, I think this is enough for the demonstration for now. So let's return to the slide deck. Um. There we go. So. I've talked an awful lot about Tesseract until now, but how, how do I even know this is the right library to choose? Well, of course I don't. I know this is a library that allows me to do a demo quite quickly, but how do you know which OCR library to choose anyway? Well, this is a problem that I had also, because I worked at a project where I had an OCR requirement, and I went to some library selection, and this is, this is what I did. Let's enter the third dimension. Tom, 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 bom, 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 bom. Yeah, also a science fiction movie, but still the wrong one, sorry. Uh, but don't you worry, I'm bound to get it right in the end. Um, still, the third dimension is called choosing the right library, and Tesseract has quite a few competitors. Um, so I told you earlier that it was entered in a competition in 1994 and that it, that it beat all the other competitors, but nowadays a lot more OCR libraries exist and a few even get higher accuracies. Now, one of these competitors is called Abby Fine Reader, and it's a proprietary software. Uh, it's a company that specializes in uh, recognition of optical characters. It supports a whopping 192 languages. That's a lot more than Tesseract. And it has 20 million users worldwide. It outputs to various output formats, Office, uh, rich text format, HTML, searchable PDF, and plain text also. You can find out more on uh, the link that I put, it put there. Um, there's also the Google Cloud Vision API, which was launched in 2016 by Google. It supports 56 languages, and it outputs to JSON. Uh, well, this is an API uh, version of an OCR library, so you can just call it from, from any programming language, so no wrappers needed or something. 
and it in integrates very nicely with Google Images and Google Safe Search. So those are nice features, I guess. Um, I've created a small table uh, to, um, to compare the three, the three products. So uh, Abby is at the left, and Google Cloud is in the middle, Tesseract on the right. So the costs always important. Now, well, Tesseract is open source, so it won't cost you anything, so no problem to play around with it. It's all very cheap. Uh, Abby is a uh, single user license is $200, so if your company has 100 employees, $20,000 that will cost you. And Google Cloud um, Vision, well, the, f um, the first 1,000 requests in Google Cloud Vision are free, so you can try for 1,000 times. And after that, you have to pay $1.50 per 1,000 images per month. Um, well, then, the number of languages. So Abby uh, supports the most languages, and Tesseract 102, and Cloud Vision 56. How about the Java integration? Well, with Tesseract, I already explained it, it is through a, a Java native access wrapper. Uh, Abby uh, publishes an SDK, but I read they also have a, they have a, also a cloud API if you, if you want. And Google Cloud Vision, of course, only offers a REST API. About handwriting recognition, well, Tesseract is, is very blunt about this. It's not supported. So Tesseract is really focused on uh, digitizing printed text. Um, and the Abbey people say, well, we can, we can recognize some, some handwritten text, but you have to separate your characters, so you can't write in one stroke. So they call it hand-printed text. And Google Cloud Vision says, no problem, we can, we can detect handwriting. <laughs> I'm not sure if they included doctor's handwriting, but you know, <laughs> it d doesn't say in the documentation, but they claim that they support handwriting. So I would love to see an example of that if you guys want to play with it. I haven't done it in preparation for this talk, but... Who knows? Uh, so can you custom train uh, uh, the library? So custom training is if you, uh, if you, if you, uh, if you plan to use a very specific type of font or a specific type of words, for example, uh, uh, professional jargon that isn't on the internet anywhere, then you need to retrain your OCR tool. It's quite sophisticated, but the only, uh, the only uh, a solution that, that doesn't support this is the Google, Google Cloud Vision API, and the other two support custom training. So if you need this, you know which one you have to choose. And then about accuracy. Well, this is really, really arbitrary because there are a lot of uh, accuracy comparisons on the internet and also uh, scientific publications. So I can't really give you a definite, uh, definite answer, <coughs> um, but I have, like, I have taken some averages, and it, it turns out what I want to uh, what, what I want to communicate with these numbers is that uh, there's not a lot between them. So seven out of ten is still is still you know uh, it's still a great score, and nine is a bit higher. But you have to think about the cost, you know. Um, in my project, I'll tell a bit about the project uh, in a few minutes. But in my project, it was for a startup company, and we didn't have a lot of cash lying around, you know, we just had to had to get a, a few customers first, so it couldn't cost anything. So we just tried to select and we're quite happy with the results, actually. And if the results had been really bad, we, we would have been forced to replace it with something better, like Abby, for example. But then it would have cost us quite a lot. So um, I guess Tesseract is, uh, in conclusion, the worst of them, but it doesn't, it, it's not by a great mile, it's, it's just by a small bit. Um, so the question is, if the other features don't matter to you, then the question is, would you want to pay $200 per user for a slightly better accuracy? Well, I can't answer the question for you, but you can think about it. Now I have seen this, I guess. Um, so I've talked about this project a few times, and I wanted to show you a bit about it so that you can get a better understanding of the decision I had, decisions I had to make. So. In my country, the Netherlands, a lot of organizations, and these are mostly government organizations, uh, they keep paper archives, physical paper archives. And some of the documents that they store in their cabinets have to be kept for over 30 years. Now, in this day and age, it would help a lot if all paper documents could be replaced by their digital twins, right? Uh, so that you, you could just search through them. Uh, so I helped design and build a web application that um, aims to digitize all these paper archives you know, with folders like the, uh, on the right. And uh, to give you an idea, the, this is the design for the, for the user interface. This is, this is a screenshot from the final application. 
Now, uh, because this is proprietary software which is nearing production stability, the company that now owns this piece of software asked me to blur out a few things because he wants to launch it with a bang and he doesn't want to get, you know, he doesn't want the brand name to be public yet. So I've uh, blurred a few things. Um, but the general idea is still here. Uh, notice while I was blurring anyway, I was also blurring the browser that was used. I won't tell you which one it was, but it has a blue icon. <laughs> so, <laughs> but while we're blurring things, why don't we blur that one also, right? Um, now, when it came to the user interface, we tried to make it look exactly like a paper archive, as much as possible, because the people who work at the government agencies are mostly a bit older than I am, not really used to new software systems. No offense meant, of course, no offense meant, but... Um, uh, it, they said it would really help, of it help us if it looks a bit like our old paper archive. So we designed even digital twins of the paper folders right here, you know. They could, just, they could just color code it and they could add a text. Now the texts are all in Dutch, but it's, they're, they're saying things like you know, taxes and financial stuff, debtors, creditors, all financial stuff. Um, <laughs> So in the, just like in the real world, these folders could be assigned colors. And all these things, those are scanned uh, documents that came from the paper archives. And uh, you know, we even had some ideas if the user uh, managed to process uh, like 100 documents a day, this plant would sprout a few flowers, you know, Easter eggs. Great stuff. <laughs> I had a lot of fun uh, working on this project. So let's talk about a typical use case. Um, in this system. So I if a paper document needed to be digitized, it entered the system uh, through the scanner. So the user uh, operated the scanner and uh, it resulted in, of course, in a, in a digital edition of the, of the document and it would be uploaded into the web application. So there was an upload functionality. And uh, after the upload, we would store it in cloud storage and uh, parallel to the store operation, we would start immediately start an OCR recognition process and store the plain text that came from the OCR recognition in the MongoDB database right here. After that, the user is asked to provide metadata for the document. So they, they, could, they could assign a document to a, a certain category or they could, they could tell it to, to be in a specific folder or this is about department X or this is about subject Texas for 2018 or something. So metadata. And we use the metadata also to be able to retrieve these documents quickly, quickly and easily. So let's revisit the screenshot again. This time, notice the list beneath here. So this is called, this is called su uh, subject. On the wrap is a Dutch word for subject. And so all these, uh, these texts were added by the user in the metadata phase. Um, but the central part of our OCR uh, uh, requirement is, of course, this one, the full text search bar. So it just set, says in Dutch, search, ar search the archive. And um, the search bar supported full text search. And this is why we choose the MongoDB database, because it has excellent full text search support. Now, we only stored OCR text in the MongoDB database that had an accuracy of over 80%. So if Tesseract told us the accuracy is 75% for this document, we wouldn't store the plain text at all. Um, so for documents with these lower accuracies, the user was limited to search for metadata only. Um, of course, we would always store the image file in the cloud storage, so it, they could still view the document, but this uh, plain text uh, layer that wasn't present on these documents. But there were like, there was like 25% uh, documents that had low quality that I, we couldn't store the clear text and 75% of the cases we could store uh, the plain text because the accuracy was higher than 80%. Um, so the OCR result was never meant for archiving purposes. The image files were, were, were the digital twins of the paper documents, the archiving function, and, and the, full, the full text search, the, uh, the OCR text, more served as an extra layer on top of the scanned images just to provide better search functionality for the user. OK, it seems like we're right on schedule, so that's great. Finally, the fourth and last dimension. The fourth dimension. 
Tom, 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 tom. Yes, I nailed it. This is the right, the, the right music for, uh, for the movie clip, right? Thank you, guys. Yeah, I knew I would get there in the end. Um, now, the fourth dimension is called advanced features because the, all the things I've showed you until now, it's just basic stuff, you know, just, just playground stuff. But what happens if it gets really difficult? What, what do you do? Well, Tesseract and Test4j uh, support uh, a few um, a few advanced features, and th these are the features I want to show you today. So, uh, reporting confidence. How do you get confidence uh, from an OCR process, and how can Tesseract tell you about confidence? Uh, what do you do if a single con document contains multiple languages? How can you how can you still OCR that? Um, what are your uh, your options for image optimization when your image quality is not not as high as you would want, or not high enough for the OCR process? Um, what if you think the accuracy is too low, or uh, the OCR is too slow. Can you do something about it? Well, it's always a trade-off. I can uh, already tell you right now that it's either speed or accuracy, but not both. So, and uh, I'll just have a slide or two about uh, training, custom training your uh, your OCR library. I want to I want to uh, point out here that uh, these advanced features all serve one goal, and that is to improve the accuracy. In our case, this full text search functionality uh, will only will be better if the OCR results are better, if more documents can be OCR'd with a confidence that's, that's as high as we can get, then these, this full search functionality will perform at its best. So improving accuracy is the ultimate goal. Um, to better recognize the expected input documents. So if you want to improve your accuracy, you first have to know what is my accuracy right now. And um, here's where I want to talk a bit about confidence. What is confidence? To explain this, this concept of confidence a bit further, I will do a live demo in Excel. Yeah, yes, in Excel, yeah. Yes. Don't worry, I'll, I'll explain, I'll explain. So last year, I did a spring boot talk in Vienna, Fox Days Vienna, and it required internet access to get to Maven Central and to do an online vote. It took me 15 minutes to download all spring dependencies due to bad internet. And the audience was just sitting there waiting for uh, you know, <laughs> you will on only do this wrong once, you know, next time I will just grab the dependencies before. But in this case, uh, I had to do it during the talk. And even my 4G signal didn't, didn't carry, uh, carry uh, to the, the venue because it was in an underground cinema. And my, my, uh, my venue was uh, 25 meters below ground level. So no 4G signal. So I'm done doing live demos that require internet access. Excel for the win. You know, it always works. You know, no, in no internet needed. <laughs> Only joking, of course. But, but this spreadsheet that I prepared really made me understand the concept of confidence very quickly. So in this case, it's just the best tool for the job in this case. So here it goes. Let's go to Excel. <laughs> so here it is. Now, imagine that the image at the left this is the capital letter I, right? And this is the image that is in the dictionary of Tesseract or your OCR tool. So this is the image that we will check against. And if we encounter exactly this character I in a scan, an image scan, well, then the confidence will be 100%, of course, because it's, they're identical. Now, imagine that this, this image was scanned and it was converted to black and white, so one cell can only be black or white. This is, of course, it's, uh, it's a simplified example, right? But it's just for sake of the, the presentation. So imagine that this is a very old text and there are some artifacts left and right, you know, some dust particles that are, by the black and white process, are miscalculated. It could be that the eye in a finished scan result looks like this, right? Well, then you can see the confidence will be 93%. So it's just a number that expresses how much does my stored version of the capital I look like the actual scanned version of the capital I. Um, well, in this case, it's not really a problem, you know, because in the end, I think 93% will still be the highest confidence compared to the other letters in the dictionary. <coughs> but what if we would copy this and test it against the letter J? Now, I have to, <laughs> I have to do some creative copying and pasting. You guys shout out if you think it looks like letter J. Is it, is it close enough? Yeah. yeah, is this a J? I'm not sure. Uh, like this or something? 
I'm, I'm not really sure. Let, let's let's remove this stuff. Ah, this is ugly. Okay, like this, yeah. So this is the letter J. And here you can see a bit of the process that Tesseract performs. So if the letter here on the right is recognized, and it will uh, it will <coughs> compare to the letter I in the, no in the dictionary and says no, it could be an I. It's 93 yeah, percent. It could be J, but it's 88 percent. So you know, it it doesn't. It's it's lower than 93. So I'll 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 say it's an I. Of course, if this if these artifacts are at slightly different places, things will go wrong, right? Uh, I have to have to add this one. Uh, if I, if I remove this one, no one can tell, right? So if so, if this is the result of the OCR scan, what will it be? Oh, our tesseract will decide it's it's the J because it's one percent higher. You see, so this is the concept of confidence. So to what extent does the scanned version of the character resemble the character that I know is in the left one? And in this case, it would decide that it's a J because it's higher than this one. So that's it for the, for the Excel demo. First and last time I'm using Excel for a live demo, right? <laughs> I won't do it again. So... On reporting confidence, Test4j supports two return types, and the first one we've already demonstrated. Uh, if you call do OCR, it will just return a string which contains the plain text as a result of the OCR process. Um, you can also call uh, create document with results. Oh, yeah, and it produces a list of OCR results. And an OCR result is a custom class in Test4j, and it contains the average confidence of the document and the list of words. And each word also comes with a confidence for the word itself. So we'll, we'll try that in a bit, don't worry. Now, the other, the other advanced feature was multiple languages in a single document. So uh, how can you support this? Well, you can just concatenate the language codes, and separate them by a plus sign, and then it will try to recognize both languages. So in this case, uh, English and NLD, the, the, it's Dutch, my, my native language. It will try to recognize both languages in a single document. Okay, that's great. So let's demonstrate it for a bit. Here we go. So uh, confidence first. Well, if you want to uh, um, compute confidence, you have to uh, call a different method. So let's not call do OCR this time. As you can see, they only return strings. Let's call create documents with results, and it will re uh, return a list of OCR results. Um, results. Okay, and um, uh, what do we have to pass to th to this method? I think there are four parameters, but I can't uh <coughs> I, I can't remember the order. So, first a string array with file names, then a string array with output bases. So in this case, it will write the plain text as a text file to the output base. Um, you can see that this this API is is meant for uh, for batch batch processing, but in this case. For simplicity, I'll just I just pass it one, one argument. So in this case, let's go for source main resources, and then I would say um, the image file file name, image file okay, name, and it will automatically uh, append a txt extension. So don't have to worry about that. Uh, this will be um, the location of the image file. So get absolute path. This is the location of the image file. Then what is the third third parameter? I keep forgetting these. It's uh, a format. So the format that I want the output in, uh, which is what's it called? Rendered format. Well, I want just plain text. And the last one is page iterator level, I guess. Yeah, page iterator level. Uh, I'll just start with Word, but I'll explain a bit more what these uh, these iterator levels uh, exa mean exactly. Word. What's wrong now? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so.
singleton list. Thank you, IntelliJ. And this results thing is the one that I want to print. So let's print results. And this one is no longer needed, so let's delete it. I think it might work. <laughs> I'm not promising anything. Let's run it. Oh, this. Every time I use create documents, I get I get these uh, errors, but it's it's not a problem. <laughs> not for the demo, anyway. Um, so, the first thing that you can see is the average text confidence. So it says for our clean code uh, sample, it says 95%. So that's quite great, and it says 82 for the Greek one. Um, so that's also okay, I guess. And um, the iterator level means that in this case, we, we're getting per word, we're getting the confidence for the word. So this is the next word, we're getting the confidence. You can also, so you can, you can tie this down to a single symbol, and you can also make it a bit larger. So I'll, I'll make it a bit larger for text lines so that every line gets its own confidence. And in that case, you can also read the plain text a bit better. So here we go. Here you can see this is the text. And for every text line, there is a confidence f for the text line. And there is an average confidence. So this is the way you can, you can get the confidence out of it. So, and, and then I, um, I put on the slide, what if you have a multi-language document? Let's comment these out uh, and create a new line. What if you have a multi-language document? I, uh, I found this on the internet. Your text, it's a small document with I think five or six different languages. So it's English, then it's German, then French, then Italian, I guess, <laughs> Spanish and Portuguese. So six different languages. What will Tesseract make of this? <laughs> um, well, let's first change this one to, it's called Eurotext, text. And let's start with English, right? So let's run it. <laughs> Well, here we go. Confidence is 91. And you'll see that this part is OK because it's English. And then it gets to this one, and it gets a little bit funky. You know, what's, what's this word? <laughs> you know, if you just take the image with it. It's supposed to be a U umlaut, right? But it, it gets two eyes because this character is not present in the English dictionary. So we need, really need to pass German also or otherwise the German sentence will not be, well, it will be garbled. So let's add German also. Let's run it again. Oh, this time you see that the German part looks a bit better, you know? I, this word looks better anyway. Um, so officially, you should just add all the language codes behind each other. Um, though I have found that when uh, uh, the language changes mid-sentence, the Tesseract is not handling this very well. So it works quite well if every language is a, a new sentence. So English, and then a new sentence, German, and then a new sentence, uh, Italian. But like in this case, it switches from uh, Italian to Spanish, and from Spanish uh, to Portuguese, and the recognition rate's not so, not so well, not so good. Um, Though I cannot imagine why you would want to change languages mid-sentence, so <laughs> in that case, it doesn't really matter. Uh, for our uh, OCR project, we, we dealt mainly with Dutch and English, so we, in that order we recognized them, first Dutch and then English. So we had NLD plus ENG in the language code everywhere. But anyway, this is the way you can do it, so let's go back to the slides. So, only a few things to show you now. Um, image optimization. Well, of course, you could pre-process your images, you know, convert all the colors to grayscale, or just convert it to black and white, or de-skew your image, or whatever you want. But uh, Test4j is also bundled with a few helper methods. They are contained in the image helper class, and uh, these are the things you can do. Um, you can convert your image to binary, so black, white. You can convert your image to grayscale. You can invert your image if, if you think that it leads to better accuracy results, or you can rotate your image. Um, I've, I've tried a few of them, but uh, it's very hard to get one solution, you know? The best thing is to do is just make sure that your input is of the best quality possible. And uh, of course, you can just uh, batch, uh, in, in batch, convert everything to black, white. That, that could help a bit, but you have to test for yourself for your own, uh, your own inputs. 
Um, so these are the things you can do. Um, now, if if it doesn't, uh, if if you're not, if you can solve your problems, um, there's a very very good wiki article on the the Tesseract GitHub page, uh, with all kinds of steps you can take to improve the quality, including screenshots. So if you're really into it, you can just uh, go to this URL and try it. And then. The last thing that I'll show you in the last demo is the speed accuracy trade-off. There are two types of training data actually bundled with Tesseract, and the one that we have used so far is the fast one. Uh, but there's also uh, the, best uh, the best one, and the best it had been has been trained on a lot, more, uh, uh, a lot more input data, so it can achieve a greater accuracy. But it comes at a cost because the OCR process will be a lot slower. Um, I see I have only four minutes, so I'll just demo the speed accuracy trade-off um, to be able that we uh, we, we stop uh, on time. So let's 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 do one more run with the uh, the best one. Um, so all we have to do is, for example, you know, add a boolean use best, and um, if use best is true. Oh, let's do it a better way. Here we go. Use best trinary operator. Copy this thingy here. And paste it here. Test data best. What's wrong, people? <laughs> I need to close my string. I downloaded the the best uh, the best one on the hotel Wi-Fi yesterday. It took uh, one and a half hours. Crazy. So. <laughs> Find a good Wi-Fi spot before you <laughs> start doing this. Uh, let's 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 take the clean code again, right? Because uh, I'm using this one because it's the largest example that I have. So the page full of text is the largest one. What I want to show you is that we perform both of these: ones with a fast track and ones with the uh, ones with the the, the best. So like this. I think this will work. So here it goes. This is the first one, quite fast, I hope. Ah! <laughs> okay. <laughs> this took quite a while because it took the, be the best. Thank you for that. <laughs> so I, inver <laughs> I inverted. Uh, it, like this, it should work. But <laughs> Always check your Boolean expressions, uh, kids. <laughs> I haven't. So. Um, you are maybe wondering what happened to the confidence. So this was the best run, and the confidence is still 95%. So um, maybe behind the comma it will be a bit higher, but um, yeah, practically this is no difference. So why would you use the best in this case? I'm not sure. You could try it for certain input documents. If it, if it is a better accuracy for you, you can try it. In our case, in our project, um, the OCR step was a batch process. So um, we could have used the best a dictionary uh, without without any problem because it wasn't like it was it wasn't a blocking transaction so the user wasn't waiting for the result or something it was a uh, background process so we could have used it no problem okay so uh, let's wrap it up final slides so just a bit of thoughts about custom training. So the training data that wa were provided for Tesseract, uh, they have been trained on 400,000 text lines uh, with over 4,000 fonts. And the training texts were extracted from the internet uh, from pages that spent 2015 to 2018. So um, unless your input contains a very weird, unusual font or some very specific professional jargon that has never appeared anywhere on the internet, there's really no need to retrain the engine. But if you would want it, you could do it. Now, there are three types of custom training. And the first one is fine-tune. So if you have a very unusual font that nobody use, uses in the world, you could fine-tune it. So um, you can start with an existing trained language, uh, language data and train, then train on your specific additional data. Um, so there's the link, it's a bit small, sorry. But the, the link on the uh, Tesseract wiki explains a bit more about the training. Uh, you can also cut off the top layer of the neural network and retrain a new top layer using the new data. If fine-tuning doesn't work, 
this is most likely the next best option. Uh, this will be a good example for a new language that hasn't been done before. So w not one of the 102, but a, an additional language. And the final option, retraining from scratch. Now, this is a daunting task, unless you have a very representative and sufficiently lar large training set for your problem. Um, and you're likely to end up with an overfitted network that only really does run the training data, not on the actual data. For example, just don't do this. It's a lot of work. You won't get anything out of it. <coughs> so, final slide here. Let's talk a bit about the recapture project. Anyone remember the recapture project? If you do, you're getting really old <laughs> because the new version is this, right? Uh, but the recapture project is actually pretty interesting because it was primarily used to validate that the user is in fact human, but it's also an example of training an OCR library. In this case, the training data is acquired by crowdsourcing it, so delegating the work to millions of web browser users, and it was actually quite clever because, as it turns out, one of these words was already known by Google. You can't know which one. So when you type the first word that was known, when you typed it without any mistakes, it assumed that you would type the second one also, right? And then they would add that to the training data. So it's kind of a clever OCR system. Uh, so, but we live in modern times now, it has been replaced by this. Now, the fact that it's been replaced seems to be good news for us, but it, it must be that modern OCR tools like Tesseract 4 are performing to the limit, you know? They are, they are able to solve these recaptchas. So anyway, you can't be as unlucky as the next person who got this one and read, don't type. What do you mean? What do you mean don't type? And he got stuck in the capture forever. Yeah, the poor thing. So if you're really interested in the subject, here's a slide with some further reading. The first article is an excellent article by Mr. Ray Smith, and it's on the Tesseract 3 engine with all the inner workings and uh, all kinds of image, um, image samples. It's a really great article. Um, well, of course, test react on GitHub. You can just clone it and play with it, check it out. And if you don't want the big C++ system on your laptop, you can even try it online on newocr.com. Just upload an image and see the, see the OCR take place. I've, I've run out of time, but if you have any questions, please come, come see me after the talk. Um, the slides, if you want, are also on the internet. I will tweet about it also uh, if you want to see a bit more. Um, for now, I hope this was useful, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> okay.